take the center. All yeah. Right. So, Internet of Things. There was a fascinating report out of uh, 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 McKinsey last month. In fact, I think, is Michael Chewy in the room here somewhere? One of the authors, should, there he is, right in the back. One of the authors right there in the back. Fascinating report, it said at the top end, Internet of Things could be worth $11 trillion in the global economy in 2025. And just to put that in perspective, $11 trillion in 2025 would be about one-tenth of the total economy. You buy that, Mike? Well, you know, that's, like you said, um Alan, that was the high end. I think the low end range was more like around a four, four or five. That's no matter what the number is, I mean, nobody knows what the future looks like. But the one thing I can tell you is uh, I believe the Internet of Things is a powerful force. It's definitely sweeping the products that are being built today. And I think it's solving real problems. Um, I think about the ability to have connected cars, about being able to, the benefits of health um, on, your, on your own body. Um, and many other things, whether it's factories or retail, anywhere. Um, I think there's going to be so much data and so much information that's available. The cost to get at that data and the information is continues to become lower and lower. And I think it has the potential of being as potential. powerful as what McKinsey says. So, so I'm a believer. But the potential. So we have to talk about some of the things that could stand in the way, and we'll get to those. But Hubert, I want to ask you, because I, I remember when you took over Best Buy, it's been, what, two and a half years? Yep. Yeah, two and a half years ago. Uh, people were writing off that company as dead. That's right. Over, you know, you walk in Best Buy, you see you want to buy something, and then you go to Amazon yeah. and order it, and there was no business there. You think the Internet of Things is is critical to your turning it around? So not dead is better than dead, right? So yes. not dead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And uh, by the way, the, the key thing we did to to do this was to match internet prices, make sure that our prices were competitive, so that you know it would be no reason to go anywhere else and compete on the basis of service. We believe that the Internet of Thing is uh, the next big technology wave, and it's going to impact the consumer uh, in, in very meaningful ways and provide opportunity. Let me uh, elaborate a bit. From a customer standpoint, I think we can all relate to this. 15, 10, 15 years ago, what did we have in our homes? We had a desktop computer connected to a printer. We probably had a big CRT TV, uh, a cute stereo system. They were all connected to the wall for electricity. They were not connected to each other. Today, what do we have in our homes? Our TV is probably smart. We have a downstreaming music service. If we have kids, they play games online. We probably have a home office that's all you know, web-enabled, and then home security and automation. Now, all of this is enabled by the network, the, the wireless network we have in our house, and then access to the internet. Now, let me do a quick be, test. Be, because they, OK, you asked your quick, question. Quick, I think I know what you're going to ask. Quick test in the room. How many of you if, you, if you're happy with the way that your network is working at home, raise your hand. <laughs> okay? If you then are not happy and would like to help from us, raise your hand. Okay? I'll see you after class. <laughs> and the beauty of that is that, uh, you know, th this technology is evolving so quickly. In order, in order to know what you need to buy, then to install it, and then to support it, mo there's a large segment out there that needs help. And we believe the combination of our online presence, our stores, and our ability to go to people's homes is a unique advantage uh, we have. And so our mission is to look after customers who are interested in new technology and need a bit of help and then help them you know, with that across these channels. So you're transitioning from a product model to a service model? We're transitioning to a, uh, being product, mainly product focused to being service focused or service led. We're transitioning from being a transaction oriented company to also being a relationship company. Uh, I think the analogy of the IBM transformation of the, of the 90s, remember when Lou Gerstner transformed the, you know, IBM into a service-led company? There is a question of whether we can do the same in the consumer space and really help uh, first and foremost with you know, the, the problems the customers are trying to, to solve and have our system designers and our Geek Squad agents you know, be your relationship guy. We can be your IT department. How about that? Who is interested in me being your IT department? Yeah. Yeah. Where's yeah. your hand? And yeah. Mike, we've been talking about the consumer side of this and the possibilities, but the McKinsey report said two thirds of the value is really in the in the business side, transforming the way uh, we work mm -hmm. and the way businesses operate. What are you seeing happening there? Yeah, I think it's. Uh, I think this the the possibility of that. That whole the internet number that you talked about is is really really it's really broad based. So automotive, they talk about anywhere from 200 billion all the way up to a billion dollars around connected cars. 
around the ability not to have accidents, to self-diagnose, uh, self-diagnostic maintenance, um, even saving lives where tens of thousands of people get into accidents. Two, you, 200 billion to a trillion. 200 billion to a trillion, thank you. Um, things like healthcare, the estimates, if you can improve uh, health, uh, the health experience by 10 to 20% and reduce chronic disease and things, you can save potentially over two trillion. You have factories that, that where each of the piece of equipment get connected. Um, you have implications in terms of energy usage, in terms of utilization optimization, in terms of safety. So whether it's, whether it's those or whether it's agriculture, where you can optimize the use of understanding what is in the soil, optim uh, whether there's any nutrients, um, what the, um, you know, the moisture content is, and being able to do this all automatically. So th these are saving, these are, these are solving real problems. And that's why I think that uh, this intelligence of things that are occurring right now is, is really, really valid. So it's a great vision, but there are a lot of things standing in the way, and we ought to talk about some of them. One of them is the one that Hugh Bear has already mentioned, which, okay, maybe all these things are no longer just plugged in the wall, they're connected to the same network, but in most cases, they still aren't working together very well. There's an interoperability right. question, which gets even bigger when you move into yeah. the business space. So interoperability is one of the key things. I think there's uh, good hope that the, the industry will go to open standards. I think at the last CES, Samsung in their keynote indicated that they would go open standards. That would be helpful. Now, let's not dream. It's always going to be complicated in part because technology is evolving so, so quickly. And that's where, again, I think a, a systems integrator role, uh, again, like in the B2B space, uh, where an IBM or Accenture can help you choose and integrate, I think, as some, uh, some value. So, uh, there, there's going to be some good uh, wishful thinking, but uh, the reality, I think, is going to be more. Complex. I have to say, that's where I had the most questions about the McKinsey study. That's a 10 year time frame. Can we get all these systems to talk to each other in a useful way within 10 years? Well, I think it's just going to keep getting better. Um, like we talked about, you do need interoperability, you need standards to be set and developed. Um, we need to have secure devices. We have to deal with the data privacy issues associated with these devices. There's going to be a lot of things that we're going to have to solve to get to the vision of the McKinsey study. But, you know, once again, if the consumer really wants these kind of products, if it actually helps them live, if it changes the way they live and work and play, um, they'll adopt those systems and the standards will get solved, the security issues will get solved, and I think, David, privacy issues will get solved over time. You mentioned the privacy issue. We also have the related cybersecurity issue. Uh, I hope all of you have gotten a cover of the latest issue of uh, Fortune magazine that has the remarkable story by Peter Elkind that really tells what happened at Sony. Uh, it's a, a sad but instructive story. We're now reading about the, uh, the government uh, hacked the Office of Personnel Management, 21 million people who had the most personal details of their lives hacked, and we don't know what's going to happen to that. Uh, to what extent is that going to slow down this vision that the two of you have been talking about? You know, I think for, for customers, it's uh, customers who are not concerned, uh, it'd be concerned about them. Uh, I, I think that's, uh, you know, if you look at your home network, how many of us have done a security audit? I'm sure at, at our companies, We've all had the IT department, the chief information security officer, do a penetration test. Who has done a penetration test in their home? Mm -hmm. uh, you have. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. So we have we'll get one to you, here, okay? <laughs> There's one over uh, there. That's good. And so I think it's going to become more important, and that should be one of the, the services that's, uh, that's provided uh, to make sure that from a security standpoint, also from a data backup uh, standpoint, you know, life is getting more complicated, and I think it's, in, 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 on the one hand, it can slow down progress, but it can also provide opportunities for a whole variety of players who write innovation. And that becomes much more frightening in the business context. I mean, stopping the release of a movie is one thing, but if you're shutting down electrical systems, you know, shutting down banking systems, uh, it's a very scary scenario. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you see a lot of companies that uh, have tremendous valuations working to go solve it. Companies like Palo Alto Networks or FireEye or, uh, you know, Cisco has a, you know, a major initiative into security and, and major business into security, and these are top of mind. And I, I think if you were to pick one thing at a board of director level of major companies that they worry about most, it's probably security. And uh, once again, when I think things become real problems, I think there becomes solutions. People rally around them. They find ways to... to but in the meantime, that has to slow down this rush towards the Internet of Things. There's a paradox. When you survey consumers, um, most of us 
want to get more personalization from our favorite brands and providers, and we, we, which requires sharing data. So there's that, and on the other end, we're scared about security. So we are, I think, a bit schizophrenic uh, in the, from that standpoint. I think in the short term, I, I've not seen a slowdown uh, yeah, and I think in, the, in the consumer space, the, the, the commercial space. And I think you're getting higher and higher technology adoption. And what's interesting, in emerging markets, the technology adoption is actually twice as fast. The amount of data that emerging market really? users are actually consuming on the internet is actually about 2x what it is in, in Why? more. Well, I think that you have a, a young society coming up. You have new tools that are coming into that society. You're seeing even a lot of the consumerism, a lot of the innovation around consumer products right now. So is it may be e in emerging markets. It may be easier for emerging markets to get to the Internet of Things because they don't have all the intermediate complications that we have. Yeah, and I think it's um, and I think the adoption, if the adoption rate's higher, and if the speed of that adoption continues to go up, I think there's an opportunity for a for it to move along and, and much quickly. We always think about the, the Internet of Thing and the adoption of the Internet of Thing in the United States. But if you think about it on a world basis, you have this enormous amount of emerging, um, of um, an emerging middle class where you have tens of millions of people moving into the middle class all the time. Many of them are very, very young people that, that have a, an inclination for more and more of this technology adoption. So, and it's going to change how fast and, and the so, rate at which this will occur. So can I get both of you, because we all talk about this uh, at an abstract level, how uh, the profound changes that this allows. But can you give me the, the coolest, most useful application that you've seen so far, either one of you? Just give, let's get a so couple it, of examples. Yeah, so I, I like to, to break it down and make it very concrete and very real today. Uh, I think. You know, in the house, there's, I see three different stacks, entertainment, productivity, and security and automation. Already today with our TVs, you know, to, to me, smart TVs are part of the Internet of Things. And so the, the amount of content that we watch through streaming uh, is, is part of this, and that's uh, so cool. Uh, from a music standpoint, I think Sonos and Spotify and other services are, have completely changed the way we enjoy music, going from a very finite library of content to uh, infinite access to, uh, to content. Uh, that's not necessarily what most people think immediately about uh, when we talk about the Internet of Things, but from a consumer standpoint, that's, that's now and that's real. Online gaming is another great example uh, of that, how it has, uh, it has changed. Uh, from a productivity standpoint, I'm on the road. I see an interesting document. I like to think about it when I go home. You know, I can print remotely to, to my home printer while I'm in this, you know, flying on a on a plane coming to, to Aspen. So that's not even talking about the next wave, which is all of the control systems. So the smart thermostats, the smart cameras, yeah. uh, and all of these things. So I have my kids, you want a cool thing, I have, my, I have a second place, not in Aspen, unfortunately, but in Val d'Isère in France, and I have the kids enjoying the apartments in, the, in that ski resort. I can watch them through the drop cam. That's pretty wow. cool. You know, I have uh, a, how do they feel about that? <laughs> they, they, they wave and smile. And how old are this, your kids? They're 28 and 25. They wave and smile and say, bye, Dad. <laughs> Mike, give me, let's know, get into the business, into yeah. the uh, B2B space. You know, it's, yeah. it's um, just uh, one follow-up comment on that. Um, when I think about the interesting things we see, we actually see things a lot earlier than Hubert sees them. Sorry, I'm slow. Um, <laughs> we're, <laughs> we, we actually see them in design standpoint and in concept standpoint. Right. And a lot of things that, that we see we actually can't talk about. So we have a million square feet you, just in Silicon Valley. You're among friends. It's not <laughs> and we're doing roughly like five new product introductions a day just in Silicon Valley, have huge operations in Israel and Shanghai and other locations. So we see a lot. And, and none of it I can talk about. But the thing I, I see that's the most interesting coming along to me are the digital health applications. I think the body um, as a system is something that's it self-regulates itself, of course, but to have additional digital tools and information about the body that can help diagnose, uh, whether it's chronic e uh, diseases or just think about like a blood glucose, um, where if anybody knows of anybody with diabetes and they're pricking their finger, just think about, and they're getting an individual data point on the body's condition at that moment in time. Think about having continuous monitoring systems that are, are giving you better data about how to diagnose and treat. And so I, I see the most interesting thing come along as digital health. health. And those are the things that I know are going to make a difference because they, they solve real problems. Let me talk a, a little bit about how we're going to get here because one of the interesting things about this conference is it brings together big companies and small companies, startups. Uh, this is a very rapid changing field. 
Is it the big companies that are going to get us to this 2025 vision? Or is it startups and, and new companies created in the last year, not yet created, that are going to get us there? Well, I think we need them both. Um, and I think the big companies have the scale and they have the channel, but sometimes they don't have an innovation process and they don't have the desire to disrupt their own, their own business model in exchange for the next generation. So sometimes we're going to need that scale. And if we can take innovations that occur in startup companies and attach them to those channels and that scale, it could be helpful. In other cases, we're going to need the innovative new companies to actually be entirely disruptive around an existing business model. And the example I like to use are things like, you know, Uber. You know, you think about the innovations that have occurred in the taxi industry over the last 30 years, and it's like almost nothing. And then you contrast that to Uber completely disrupting all on the back of pre-existing internet infrastructure, the cloud, the cell phone, Google Maps. All these things are pre-existing um, things that everybody has that you can build a disruptive business model around. So I actually think you need both. I actually think you need access to that channel and scale, and at the same time, you need to have the disruptors to completely change the business model. Sound right to you? Yeah, I think the, um, you know, this is a space that gets disrupted. So the Internet of Things is a new field, and it, op it resets everybody's position because you have the opportunity to rethink how to approach this. So this is an area that's fascinating because you, the number of companies and types of companies that have developed a keen interest in the interest of thing is limitless. I bet in the room, you know, most people are involved in that. So you go from the big ecosystems, you know, players, to the the carriers, the the the, the cable operators, uh, new startups from a device standpoint, and then a company like ours, which is at the customer interface. Everybody's looking at it, and the winners are not determined. And I, one of the things that uh, struck me ever since I became the CEO of Best Buy is the uh, whoever's at the top today was probably not at the top 10 years ago, and it's probably not going to be at the top 10 years from now. So this is a very exciting, because everything gets reset because the, the, the rules of the game are going to be different. Yeah, I can tell you we just did that calculation with the publication of the Fortune 500 issue. 55% of the companies in the Fortune 500 today weren't there 20 years ago. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, uh, so there, is, uh, there is rapid turnover, but there's also some stability among some cases. I want to talk about data. I'm going to open it up to questions in just a minute. But I want to talk about data because all of this connecting everything is just generating massive amounts of data. And we hear every day about the great value of data. Data is the new gold. Data has so much value. But it doesn't have value if you don't know what to do with it. And another thing in the McKinsey study, Michael, you're going to have to give me a, a, a cut on your profits. I'm promoting your study so much. Another thing it said <laughs> it was is- It a free study, so here you go. Yeah, well, that's, that's, uh, <laughs> okay. that's standard for me. Uh, uh, one percent, one per, only one percent of the data being generated is actually being analyzed and used in any way. Mm -hmm. How does data fit into this equation? Well, you know, I think I think the optimization of any system. Um, think about the system of intelligence. You know, we're rapidly moving into this intelligence age. We're rapidly moving in where the things that are out in the marketplace are intelligent. Those intelligent things are hardware devices that are capturing data. They're analyzing their environment. They're taking data from their environment. They're adapting, they're adjusting, they're changing, they're tweaking. And all that data is also going back. So it's not only the fact that it's the intelligence of things that's changing the world right now, where you have real-time information in the field, but now all of a sudden you have the ability to analyze that data. And to me, the system of intelligence almost is where you have hardware devices that are super low cost and these sensors capturing data. You have software running it. You have data that's being captured. You have great analytics that comes out of that. And then you go visualize the data and actually draw management conclusions out of it. This, this whole system of how you get to value creation, I think it's going to perpetuate, or perpetuate itself throughout all these different systems. It's about the system now. It's not, it's not about products anymore. It's about systems. And, and a huge part of that is going to be data. And I, I think you're going like to see more and more of that data captured, analyzed, visualized and acted upon. It feels like we're still optimize. a long way away. So I think it's all about what you do with it, what you do with the data. You can have infinite amount of data if you don't do anything with it. It's pointless. From a customer standpoint, you know, one thought we have is that you know, for, from a customer standpoint, it's important for a network at home to operate so that we don't, we don't get cut off while watching you know, this show or you know, the Super Bowl. Um, developing some remote uh, diagnosis, mo remote monitoring, preventive maintenance, predictive maintenance capabilities around the devices we have in our house 
I think would be very beneficial. And one of the things we want to do is work with our key vendor partners to make sure that these capabilities exist so that you don't wait for the, let's say, the Comcast box to fail to then call. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the vendor and get it, uh, get it fixed. So that I, would be helpful. I'm going to open it up for questions, but I want to start with uh, Stacy Higginbotham right here, who is one of the wonderful reporters we hired from GigaOM uh, and uh, who has specialized in uh, uh, the Internet of Things. And, and Stacy, you and I have been talking a lot about she's this. She's checked her own network That's for right. security. Oh, cool. and, she, and she's one of about three people who's <laughs> checked her home. No, uh, Stacy has the most connected home of anyone I know. She has every device. She's probably been good for Best Buy in Thank the process. Thank you. <laughs> Later, I'll ask you about the Best Buy retail experience and sure. maybe give you some feedback. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have some feedback coming from there as well. <laughs> so see me after class. I actually want to change my question, Alan. Is that okay? Yeah, you're, you're, this, it's wide this, open. This is a cybersecurity question because I think it's really important. There are a lot of, the way that threats come into the home, a lot of people focus on the network and Wi-Fi, but a lot of the products that consumers and companies are bringing into their networks, the companies building them focus on the application and not the physical device. And as a contract manufacturer, I'm wondering what the role of a contract manufacturer is in encouraging these companies to secure their physical hardware. Because sometimes they just outsource that directly to a company like you. Sometimes they give you specs and you're like, well, gosh, are you sure you want to use that chip? Because maybe there's a more secure chip. So how do you kind of walk that, that line? Because it's an important one. Yeah, no, it's a good question. So first of all, I'd say we're really not a contract manufacturer. That was like the 90s when it was like low cost labor and then we moved into electronics manufacturing services, which was more sophisticated worldwide systems. Today, I, I think about ourselves more as a sketch to scale company. We actually work with companies all the way from the design stage, all the way through to scaling them all around the world. So as these products need to get connected, we think about designing and building intelligent products that are operating in a, in a highly connected world. So I think we, we might, as a manufacturer, we probably build 10,000 products. I don't know how many are actually connected products, but thousands. We may actually have more um, experience working with companies to actually design and build their products than, than almost any other company. And, and when I think about working with them and, and considering we're working with them on sketch scale and we're working in a faster, more disruptive world, faster product life cycles, more disruptive products coming in the marketplace, more innovation coming out of places like China that are disrupting business models. All these are creating a faster, quicker world where all these products are rapidly coming into the marketplace. And one of our roles is just to work with these manufacturers and together we're probably a lot stronger to go create a safer product. But you actually, you're, you're actually correct. You have to work with the product all the way at the end connected node, all the way into the silicon, and be sure that the software and the middleware to connect the silicon with the product applications uh, is safe and reliable. And I, and I like to think that maybe two heads are better than one in this case. Um, it can go faster, go more securely. And the other benefits you know, that we have in terms of working with a company like like Flex, which I'm going to redefine as like a sketch to scale company, not a contract manufacturer, um, is really to work with them to, to learn. And you know, one of the benefits of a company like ours, we do $26 billion around the world. We have like 12 different industries where we do over a billion dollars of revenue, which is, which is probably the equivalent of $3 billion of commerce in you know, more than 12 different industries, is we get to see how different industries solve that problem. And we get to participate in helping a company that's trying to connect a washing machine learn from companies that are doing a smartphone to be able to understand how to, how to create a more secure device. We have another question right here. And then right there. Thanks. Uh, Rick Chavey with Interworks. Um, I'd like to ask a question about, as you see this kind of collapsing of boundaries between retailer, manufacturer, design, you're getting so involved. I mean, how does that go forward in the future? to where maybe you're not really a manufacturer anymore, you have manufacturing competency, but maybe you don't even have any plans. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good question because more than ever before, we have this, this term at Flextronics, which is collaborative innovation. We actually think the world is moving fast enough. And, and again, we, we kind of have the power of insight because we see all these different industries and within any, in every industry, we have quite a bit of customers. So we get to see a lot of operating strategy, we get to see product strategies, and we get to see how they compete geographically. 
So if you put all that together, we have actually helped formalize a, a, a system of intelligence, I mean, or a, um, an intelligence of things ecosystem, which is built around sourcing innovation, culting it, cultivating innovation, and then actually applying cross-industry learning to accelerate that innovation before you get it commercialized into the product. So we actually think it's our role now in today's marketplace in this world of collaborative innovation where you have to go so fast and product life cycles are so short that we actually source innovation. We work with VCs more than we ever have in the past to understand what new technologies are coming. We're working with universities more than ever before. We have our own accelerators. We have multiple invention centers around the globe where we're trying to access the, the smart disruptors and the smart innovators. And we've put this all into a process because the world of even three years ago where you can take a, even a smartphone and put it on a one year life cycle. I know there's some companies that do that, but not that many, <laughs> like one. Um, but if you go over to China today, you'll see these innovations and these product life cycles happening in three or four months. Everything's being accelerated. And unless you co-collaborate with the entire supply base, then you're gonna be left behind. Yeah. So part of running a supply chain today is the innovation across the supply chain and being able to, to take many different constituencies, constituencies of that supply chain and, and bring them together. Question right here. Paul Brico from Greycroft. Uh, more for Hubert. So you mentioned providing another layer of service in that context of your outsourced I IT department. So I'd like to get your take on the new generation of startups that are providing on-demand services to the home and in-house tech supply and service, and then also Ron Johnson, ex-head of Apple Retail's new company, Enjoy, and what he's doing in providing concierge-level service to consumers looking to buy consumer electronics. Yeah, I think Ron's idea is spot on, which is that uh, you know, we all need, many of us need help to fully appreciate and learn about the, f the functionalities uh, in a product. We, you know, I, I don't want to brag too much, but we, we do have about 20,000 people in our service organization that to a degree uh, do that uh, uh, today. Uh, and I, if, if I can help you with any of your needs, I'd be happy to do this. The uh, question of the, uh, you know, using a la Uber or Airbnb, uh, other people to do the service. I think there's room for different models. Clearly, our view is to, for the most part, to use our own personnel to help uh, provide that service to, uh, to customers rather than leveraging everybody in town. I'm not saying that the other approach doesn't, you know, doesn't make sense, but for us, we think that uh, it's, a, it's a better way to provide a, uh, a predictable uh, uh, and reliable level of service. When we get invited into people's homes, uh, it's a big deal. You know, we deal with things that are essential to them, and being able to you know know, know who came to your house, um, have a certain degree of, of certification, uh, have a traceability of what the intervention was, uh, have a blueprint of your you know install base in your house. Uh, we feel that there is value uh, there. Now, it's never going to be. 100% internal versus external, but my personal bias is to push us at Best Buy towards something that's uh, uh, integrated. Any questions from over on this side? Someone have a quick last question. Can't. Anyone? Stacy, you get the uh, last word. All right. Okay, so if data is going to be the established gold in, in the Internet of Things. How are you guys, or how will businesses react to the fact that the value of data is constantly being commoditized and that there are constantly going to be new startups and new ways to access that data? And your business is going to just be constantly changing to react to that. So go. <laughs> All right. So, uh, you know, for us, we're going to get data from a whole variety of sources as relates to uh, customer behaviors. A key strategy we have is to be helpful to customers at key times in their lives. So somebody is about to move, somebody is getting married, uh, and there's a set of services that can be provided on that uh, occasion. Uh, if I take the move, you know, think about moving all of your IT infrastructure, let's say from Minneapolis to Silicon Valley, which would be attractive, but from a, an infrastructure standpoint, it's a real challenge. Being able to get to you before you move and providing that service I think uh, is, is very exciting. So we're going to get that data from a, a whole variety of sources 
as you know, you know, you can know when somebody's about to move or somebody's about getting about to get uh, married. Uh, and so that's the, the opportunities on using uh, the data. We'll welcome any sources of uh, Last data. quick comment, Mike. Yeah, I, I just think the business models are going to change. We're in the, the age of intelligence. We have end connected nodes capturing data. This is not something we had five years ago. This is going to provide new opportunities for new business models, new ways to monetize uh, businesses, new ways to startups to create different disruptive business models. They'll go through cycles. There'll be multiple disruptions. And, uh, but what's different is, is the intelligent, we're in the age of intelligence. They're intelligent things. They are attached to the end, the end node. They are capturing real environmental data on a real-time basis. That's new, and it's an opportunity. Uh, gentlemen, huge topic. We barely scratched the surface, uh, but very interesting. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank